Please turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we'll be reading from verses uh, 1 through 13. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongue, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. Please be seated. Many years ago, when I was a young buck, still in uh, seminary, age 21, um, 22, uh, 20 some odd years ago, um, I was a youth pastor at a particular church uh, that was very, very charismatic. In fact, I grew up, uh, all the, in all the churches that we were part of, uh, they all promoted speaking in tongues, like what you have read here. But I want to just make a quick disclaimer, it's not what's here. So they claim to speak in tongues like what we see in Acts chapter 2, but I'm going to show you that it's not. But that was the church that I was part of and was a minister to the youth group at that time. Now at that time, I was still trying to figure everything out. Uh, I was also uh, speaking what I thought was tongues as well. Uh, when I would drive and pray for the people in the church or my friends, I would speak in tongue in traffic, uh, believe it or not, or I thought I was. Um, I didn't get into any accident because the Spirit of God was with me, obviously. Um, and one day, one night, after this college meeting at, at UCI, um, we, we, we spent that night speaking in tongues and, you know, doing all that stuff. And then as I was driving out, one of the leaders um, said, hey, Chi, do you know that the gift of tongue has ceased? And uh, I looked at him as I was driving out, you know, hitting the speed bump. I still remember that night. he was just sitting right in the church, uh, the, the stairway, which was facing toward the drive uh, exit out, out into the street. And, and I was thinking, well, you're one of the leaders, and, you, and you, don't you speak in tongues too, as we just did? And here you are, you know, just kind of like yelling it out into the parking lot. Uh, the, the gift of uh, the, these gifts, these apostolic gifts have ceased. Anyways, that night, it just launched me into curiosity. Uh, could he be true? Uh, is what, I'm, is what am, I, am I doing something that I think is true but is actually false? Anyhow, when we say the word charismatic church, uh, it's a designation for churches that believe in the apostolic gifts or the continuation of these gifts for today. And you'll see that there are basically three categories of churches. A church that, like ours, we believe that all of those have ceased. Other ministries, they are full-blown charismatic. They know they do and practice these gifts. And then there are the middle ground churches that won't take a strong position. They'll say, well, we don't know for sure. Well, once I made that decision, or once I began to learn the scripture the right way, my view began to change, and naturally, whatever I learned from scripture, I simply teach in public. 
and I was teaching the youth group at that time that the gifts have ceased, and I soon, find my, find, I soon found myself sitting in the senior pastor's office with the other leaders, and he was rebuking me in front of them. He was actually yelling at me in front of them. That's the rain. You guys can still hear my voice, right? Um, <clears throat> and so he was um, rebuking me and saying, how can you say, how can you say that the gifts have ceased? And I, in fact, I think I'm going to just hit record on my iPad. Uh, I, I don't think that recording is working. Um, so I do want to keep this recorded or else I'm going to have to speak, it, speak again uh, later on. So that day I was sitting in the pastor's office. This was Saturday morning. And in front of all of the staff members, uh, he was rebuking me and saying, how can you teach this to the kids that the gift have ceased? And he pointed to this passage in Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 12 again. Um, I'm sorry, verse 11. It says, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And he looked at me and in front of all the, all the staff who were just, just kind of in shock that he was pointing me out. And he's saying, do you not see that you are preventing people from speaking the mighty deeds of God in the language of tongues? And, and that's what he's saying. When people speak in tongues, this is what they're doing, speaking the mighty deeds of God. And his claim was that we can still continue to practice speaking in tongues even though we don't know what we are saying exactly because the purpose and nature of tongues was to declare the mighty deeds of God. Well, at that, on that day, I didn't know how to answer. I kept my mouth shut. Uh, I was a little bit shocked. And he pointed out a verse that I thought was very strong and I just didn't know what to say. And he said, okay, you know what, from now on, don't teach that. Um, and, and everything was just, you know, concluded on that session. I did continue to teach that it ceased. Um, and I and eventually left that ministry. When you look at that verse, uh, and this is in hindsight, I realized you can't use this passage to support the existence of or the continuation of the gifts. If you look carefully, Luke is very, very particular about making it clear that the gift of tongue is a language of men. Uh, verse 8, how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents, residents of Mesopotamia. Now, all these people, they gathered in Jerusalem, but they were living in other places where they spoke in other languages, and they were shocked to hear that these disciples of Christ, 120 of them, were speaking in their language, even though they had no education of it. So clearly Luke is saying, we hear them. We can hear them speak the mighty deeds of God. What the pastor was saying was wrong in this sense. He's saying it doesn't matter whether you understand the language or not. It is a declaration of God's mighty deeds. Well, I think this verse makes it clear that, first of all, we need to understand what they are actually saying in order to vouch that they are actually declaring um, praises to him. Now, usually at this point, charismatics will turn and say, well, the Bible teaches that there are angelic tongues, a, a language of the heavens that no one understands. And this is what people can sometimes say as they're speaking in, in, in tongues. Well, they get this from 1 Corinthians 13. Turn with me to that passage. And you're going to see that as we go through the book of Acts, we're going to come to particular passages where we'll take some time to debunk the charismatic theology along the way. The charismatics will say, and this is what I believed as well when I was younger, that there were these tongues, these languages of angels. And they would always point to 1 Corinthians 13, 
where it says in verse 1, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So it say, hey, look, right there. If I speak with the tongues of men, there's that, and tongues of angels. But let's read on. Okay? Verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. What's going on here? Well, in the English, it's somewhat clear. He's using what we call an exaggerated statement on hyperbole. For instance, in verse 2, I have if, notice, I have the gift of prophecy, and somehow I know all mysteries and all knowledge. Has there ever been a situation where someone was gifted with all knowledge, all the mysteries in his mind, and the answer is no, only Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, and God the Father knows that. Paul is using a, a hypothetical argument, saying if that was even the case, and I have no love, it absolutely amounts to what? Nothing. Now you might argue, well, but it's in the English. Anyone can take that in any way. We believe that Paul meant it, that there was a gift of prophecy, and you were able to know all mysteries. Okay, fine. Then let's look at the original language, the Greek grammar. And here... The words, the phrase, you know, if I speak or if I have or if I give, they all begin with what we call an aeon conjunction. There's a word in the beginning, it's pronounced aeon. And if you connect that to a subjunctive, and we talked about this in detail on Friday night with the hina subjunctive, here is what we call an aeon subjunctive clause. When you put the word aeon and then a subjunctive, subjunctive means about something in the future that you wish would happen. When you connect those two, it becomes a hypothetical condition. That's how the Greek grammar sets it up clearly. So if you're reading this, you know that the author is not being literal. He's, if you want to use the word literal, he's literally being completely hyperbolic. It's what if this was the case, but it's not. Okay, does that make sense? It's one extreme to the other to make a point. No one has ever noticed moved a mountain yet by faith. Right? Jesus gave that example. If you have a faith as small as a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain, get up and throw yourself into the ocean. Has that ever happened? And the answer is no. Will that ever happen? And the answer is no. Jesus Christ is making a point that you don't even have faith even as, as small as a what? As a mustard seed. Here, Paul is using an exaggerated statement to say that there's really no such thing, even if there was, and I have no love, it amounts to nothing. Now, if that doesn't convince you, I have one more verse. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It, is there an angelic language that is impossible to understand? A special language of the heavens? And the, and the answer to this, I would say again, no. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 3 to 4. Here Paul is describing his vision of the heavens. He was there. By God's um, grace, he was given the revelation of the heavens. And it says in verse 3, I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know God knows. What he's saying is, I don't know what happened. It seemed like I was really there. Was I there just by my mind or was I literally transported there? Only God knows. What he's saying was that this experience was so real, like he was actually there. And notice what he says in verse 4. I was caught up into paradise and I heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted 
to speak. What is he saying? He's saying, I heard these words, I understood it, but I'm not permitted to speak of it. If he didn't understand, there's no way he could speak of it. There's no reason for him to be amazed. But he heard words there. Okay? He was able to understand. Okay? Meaning there's no such thing as a separate angelic language. There's whatever language it was there, the Lord clearly helped, gave him the ability to understand. And we know what that language is. It's English. Everybody speaks English up in heavens. You read the Old Testament, they're all speaking English. No, okay? <laughs> Seriously, what language did they speak prior to Genesis 11? What language did they speak in, in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve? No one knows, but it's the language that everyone actually, what, understands. And God, by his amazing power, can cause everyone to speak in a different language at an instant in Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel, right? So is it possible that the Lord can just, just take away all that and cause us to understand all at once? Absolutely. The point is, whatever tongue okay, a person is speaking with that gift someone will be able to what? Understand. So going back to the example of that pastor insisting on speaking in tongues because it declares the mighty deed of God, even if he does not understand what he is saying or what someone is saying as they speak in tongues, is absolutely wrong. And I have one more example. I know of a pastor, uh, he's very dear to my heart. He's very close. He's actually lived with me for several months in college in our campus apartment. Uh, my roommate was his dad. He's a pastor in Korea, and he wrote a book uh, debunking all the charismatic views in Korea. And when, we were, he, when he was living with us, uh, he, exp he would give me all these stories of what he had to go through. Because in Korea, there is a strong push for the mystical side the speaking in tongues and all this heavenly power and what, what, what not. He used to believe in all of that stuff too. Until one night, they were having like a prayer, praise, evening service. And one pastor who was an African came and visited that church. And they both went to the service and everyone was speaking in tongues. And that pastor ran out, that African man ran out. And the, the Korean pastor followed him and said, well, what's wrong? Are you, have you never seen this? This is the work of God. This is in the Bible. Everyone is speaking in tongues. They're declaring the mighty deeds of God. He said, you do not realize they're speaking in the African tongue. I can understand what they're saying. And they're cursing God right now inside. After that, the Korean pastor thought, I need to look into this. And as he studied the scriptures, he realized he was wrong, and he began to really promote and, and try to refute uh, all of that in, 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 in Korea. He had a hard time. So I think the point is made clear. The church is never to allow any sort of language to continue if we do not know what they are what? Saying. In fact, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is exactly what Paul warned the Corinthian church against. Do not let anyone who claims to speak in tongue continue if there are no interpreters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 27 to 28, it says, If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at most three, and each in turn and one must interpret, but if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Okay? If there is no one understanding what that person is saying, he must not be allowed to continue. That's the point. And by the way, when he says here, let him keep silent, let him speak to himself and God, that's not a concession. 
it's a sarcastic statement. He's rebuking them because they're all claiming to speak for God. They're all claiming, you know, why are you, why are you prohibiting me? Let me speak in tongues. I don't know what I'm saying, blah, 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 blah. Okay, but, you know, it's, isn't it wonderful? And so Paul is saying, you know what? Why don't you close your mouth and speak to yourself and to God? And, and it's a sarcastic statement saying, you know what? Let's see what God would say if he hears what you're really saying. And you have absolutely no idea what you're what, what you're saying. So all of this is just an introduction. This is an introduction to the introduction to the chapter 2, to kind of whet your appetite as, and to see what we're going to be learning. And yes, we will look at 1 Corinthians 14 more in detail uh, as we head into that subject. Now, I just, want to, uh, turn, I just want you to turn back to Acts 2 and just realize that we're not studying the book of Acts to debunk the charismatic theology. That is not our purpose. And that should never be the purpose of studying the scripture. What you will see is this. As we study the book of Acts as it ought to be read and studied and understood, naturally it becomes an apologetic against this idea that the gift of tongues and gift of miracles and gift of prophecy is continuing today. Okay? It's a natural apologetic against their claims. You will see that that God has gifted the early church this gift for that time only. And you'll see the reasons why as we study this, this passage. So going back to Acts chapter 2, what are we learning? Well, we're going to learn these things like how did the church start? Who started it? What they do to start it? How was it sustained? What is the mission, the goal, the purpose, the intent? What is the main tool or medium by which the Holy Spirit leads the church? And overall, what is God's plan for the church? And as we study this carefully, we're going to apply certain principles that are meant for today and also to gauge whether or not what we're doing is actually biblical. Normally, people gauge the ministry based on the size, based on the programs. Someone will come in and, and look at a church and say, wow, something's going on here. It must be the work of God. They might enter this ministry and say, oh, something is lacking. I don't think this is the work of God. How do we determine if a church is truly in the will of God and started by the Spirit of God? Well, we study the book of Acts to see what happened at that time. The study of the church, the early church, is not trivial. Fifty days prior to this day in Acts chapter 2, Jesus Christ was crucified. When the Lord was there for three years, he told all in John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. When he was crucified, that light was extinguished. And darkness filled the land as God was about to pour out his judgment on those who were in darkness. The light of the world was temporarily put out. And after he resurrected, he only stayed for 40 days. And then he ascends into the heavens so where is that light? Well, that light now is transferred to the local church on earth. And this is why it says in 1 Peter 2.9, You are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And Paul says in Ephesians 5.8, You were formerly darkness, but now you are the light. Walk as children of light. The church is the light of God in this world now. Jesus Christ was that light. Now we are that light. The study of the church is not about church organization or church growth or whatnot. It's a study and the understanding of why he placed us here. We are, as it were, put into 
darkness to shine the light to the people around us. And the focus is not church fellowship, the gathering of the people socially. The focus is on the Holy Spirit residing in the lives of believers and His presence is felt in, to, a, to a certain extent to those around the ministry. That's what Hebrews chapter 6 is about. When it talks about you taste it, the heavenly gift, you taste it, the pouring out of God's blessing to the church. What is it saying? It's saying that the people who are visiting the church can literally experience the blessing of the Holy Spirit even though they were not indwelt by the Spirit of God. And in Acts chapter 2, that's what we see. The title of chapter 2 is this, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Or you can even title it this way, the response to the presence of the Spirit of God in the work, in the lives of these believers. And there are four responses. There's power, but mainly there's confusion. Thirdly, there's the proclamation or the pointing to Christ. And fourthly, there's communion. When the Spirit of God comes and blesses the people of God, there is power, a display of His power. There is confusion. There is Christ and communion. So power, confusion, Christ, and communion of the saints. Verses, five, verses 1 through 4, you see the power of the Spirit of God. Verses 5 through 13, you see confusion. And that's really what's going on here. When they're saying, oh, they're full of sweet, sweet wine. Peter says, it's only 9 a.m. How can anyone be drunk? Maybe there are a few, but there's 120 of us. Are you saying we're all drunk? In verse 12, it says, they all continued in amazement and great perplexity. That's another way of saying we have no idea what's going on. See, everyone thinks that these 3,000 who were saved, all of these people speaking in tongues, it caused the world to fear God. They didn't. When the Spirit of God comes and allows His power to abide in the people of God, only those who are believers will be benefited from it. Those who are outside will have no idea. In fact, the first thing they'll do is slander. They're drunk. So verses 5 through 13, there's confusion. Verses 14, 36, Peter's preaching Christ. And verses 37 to 47, there's the communion of the church. You know, it's interesting. When you study this carefully, it, reveal, it reveals the true nature of a church plant and what it does to the surrounding neighbors as they react to the church. A real church plant is not going to be successful. Here, they were given the grace to have 3,000 saved, yeah. But most churches planted, what's going to happen is if they're truly representing the Spirit of God and displaying the light of Christ, there will be an immediate reaction of negativity. These men are drunk, they're full of sweet wine. The first thing out of unbelievers' minds as they respond is slander. I mean, you have to reflect on this. Why are they so slanderous when a church is planted? Aren't they at least a bit curious? Don't they want to at least visit and see what it's like? No. The first thing they say is they are all what? They're all drunk. You know, Jesus predicted this, or he clarified this in John 3, 19 to 20. He said, this is the judgment that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. Planting a church in a neighborhood is for the purpose of exposing their sin. Do you think they're going to be happy about this? 
We should never expect the neighborhood to suddenly show up and say, hey, we're curious. Thank you for planning this church. What a great, great, you know, addition to the morals of this, of this of this neighborhood here, neighborhood here, it's really going to put a positive mood to everyone's heart. And the answer is that is not what's going to happen. Planting a church, and I want to include evangelism, is assaulting the darkness. But you don't see churches doing that anymore. They're catering toward the neighborhood. They're opening up to the neighborhood. You watch movies, come. We'll watch a movie here. You like to go to the theaters? Well, guess what? We'll put theater chairs in the church so that you will be comfortable here too. You don't like to carry books? Fine. We'll put it up on the screen. You don't have to ever bring your Bibles. Oh, you like to be entertained? Well, guess what? We have a skit for you. We're going to... Show you what Jesus did, not read to you or explain to you because you do not have a long attention span. And your kids want fun in their youth ministry. We have five PlayStation consoles with 20 controllers attached to each one. They'll love it here. You don't get the sense of the, the churches being like this anymore today. The church is continually embracing the world and endorsing the manners of this world. Church planning today is more of an enterprise, an entrepreneurship of a few young men who want to start something new. You know, I remember the ministry that I was part of before, and the, you know, the leadership was from the master seminary. I was from the master seminary, and I was excited to be part. Finally, after all these years of being part of charismatic churches, finally a, a group of elderly, old, uh, mature, you know, Asian American and Christians who spoke both English and Korean, and they're ready to teach the Bible as I was hoping to see in all the Asian churches. And I, I asked the senior pastor, so. How did this all happen? How did this church come to be? He says, well, you know, I was talking with one of my associates and said, you know what, Are we getting old. We need to do something significant with our lives. So we, want to, we, we started this. We want, to do, we want to do something great. And at that time, I was like, wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then as I look at this now, as I look back, did the Lord really bless that? It's more of an entrepreneurship. You want to just start something? I mean, they, all, they had different reasons. They had different other motivation, like teaching the word of God. There's a lack of Bible teaching in the Korean, Korean generation and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, all of that was good, but at the heart of it all, why did they start? Midlife crisis? They want to do something real significant with their lives, so let's start a church. Guys, this is not why anyone should start a what? A church, even if they had all the biblical reasons, if that motivation is not pure, if it's for yourself, it is not being a light to the world. The Holy Spirit calls and plants the church through people with the right heart. So what we see here is that when the presence of the Spirit of God is here, there's power but there will be confusion. But there will also be a, a, the pointing to Christ and putting Christ on display. And there will be communion amongst believers. Let's begin with verse 1. 1 through 4 is the power of the Spirit of God. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. The word Pentecost is a, is a New Testament word of an Old Testament Jewish celebration called Feast of Weeks. And the reason why they use the word penta, meaning five, or in this case, 50, it was celebrated 50 days after 
the Passover. And you can read about this in Leviticus 12, uh, Leviticus 23, verse 15, and Exodus 23, verse 16. It says, you shall count 50 days uh, to the day after the seventh Sabbath or the 49th, and then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. And it was a time where the Jews would come together and celebrate the first fruits of their harvest and give that to the Lord. Jesus died on Passover. And it was very fitting for the Father in heaven to de- for, for, for the Father in heaven to choose that day, because as you know, Passover goes all the way back to Egypt in the book of Exodus, when the angel of death flew over everyone's home, and if the blood of the lamb was not smeared on the doorpost, the angel of death would come in and kill your firstborn child. Can you imagine all of Egypt crying for their firstborn son or the firstborn child would die on that night? And it was a symbol for Jesus Christ and his blood being smeared on us that the judgment of God would pass over us. So it's very significant that Jesus Christ died on the Passover celebration. And... 50 days later, it's very, very significant that the Father in heaven would choose that day to send the Spirit of God to the church and start the church. Why? The church is the first fruit of God's work on the cross. All that Jesus did on the cross, yes, he died for the people in the past, but it was mainly to start the church, the New Testament church. It was his first first fruits. Now, the text says they were all together in one place. This is referring to not just the 12 disciples, but all 120 disciples who are up there praying. Now, they're not praying every single day, every single hour, every single moment, because it says here in verse 2 that the Spirit of God came when they were sitting. You know, they're taking a little break. They're sitting down. They're talking. They would normally be on their knees or they would be standing as they were praying. This was their normal custom. But they were sitting, meaning it was unexpected. They weren't praying for the Spirit of God to come, and then the Spirit of God came. The charismatics claim that you can make the Spirit do what you want by earnestly praying, and then the Spirit of God will come. Here, it's clear that the Spirit of God came when he, would, when he decides on his own. And so they were sitting, fellowshipping, talking, eating, breaking bread or whatnot, And then the Spirit of God suddenly comes upon them. And notice the detail here. Luke says, suddenly they came from heaven. Okay. Luke's description is to say this was a supernatural and an unexpected event. Okay. The Holy Spirit came upon us. We did not make the Spirit of God come. The Holy Spirit, keep in mind, is God. He's not a ghost. He's not some force. He's not some magical thing where you can figure out some some secret incantation and you make him, you activate him. Everyone who reads this who are not biblical are thinking in that manner. That there's God the Father, Jesus the Son, and there's this mystical force called the Spirit of God that you want to sort of tap into. Do not turn the Holy Spirit into some kind of a ghost. Okay? He is, he is, there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is a person, a being of absolute power, absolute authority. He is God. He was there from the very beginning in Genesis 1.1 where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. What that means is that when Jesus Christ spoke, the Spirit of God enacted. All of them were there when creation was being brought to existence. Now, the question is, why did he come in the form of a wind? Well, 
The Greek word for spirit is pneumatos. The phrase is pneumatos hagio. Hagio means holy. Pneumatos means spirit. It's where we get the word pneumatics, referring to air and air pressure. Keep in mind that Jesus is the only one who received a, an actual body. God is a spirit. Jesus Christ is the only one now with a physical body. The Father is immaterial and the Spirit of God is immaterial. So there's, there's the only you know, perceivable way of us understanding the Spirit is by relating to something we're familiar with, which is wind or air. So that's the obvious way the Holy Spirit is going to manifest himself to the disciples through the wind. In fact, Jesus um, uh, makes mention of this in John chapter 3, verse 8, where it says, The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So everyone was born of the Spirit. But again, that's not to say that every time you feel wind, Okay, hitting, hitting you, or you see the wind pushing all the, the wind, uh, the, the leaves, and you can hear the, the trees shake, that that's the Spirit of God. It's just a way to understand the Spirit of God's presence. But notice here, did they really feel the wind in the room? Or did they just hear the sound that strong wind makes? If you notice the, uh, the, the description, suddenly they came from heaven a noise. Okay? It, it, it doesn't say there came from heaven a wind. Does that make sense? I don't think they felt anything except the holiness of God and, the, and they heard the sound. Like, I guess in our minds, we picture those movie scenes where someone is in the darkness and then the, and then the, window, the, the window panes open up suddenly and starts clanging on the wall and this wind comes through and all the curtains are shaking and all the bed, bed sheets are flowing everywhere and you hear all the flow of the wind. That's not what I think happened because this says clearly a noise like a violent rushing wind. So they heard it but I don't think they felt any wind there. The noise was tremendous. It was loud. Or it says here, it was like a violent rushing wind. And I'm sure they understood that because on the Sea of Galilee, they felt this a couple times, right? When, they, when Jesus fell asleep on the boat, there will be a gust of wind going through the ravines and causing all kind of, of storm-like situation on the Sea of Galilee. And they could hear the wind howling and sometimes roaring through the waves. When the presence of God comes, it was powerful, loud, deafening, frightening. And it says here, it filled the whole house. This is a display of of his power. And then you get to verse 3. There appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves and they rested on each of them. Now this is where all the commentators are going to just jump at their imagination. Like just picturing this, a flame of fire resting on their head and it looks like tongue, a tongue. But it's, it's flame-like. And it's resting on each one of them. And everyone wants to describe or, or interpret why it's made up of fire. Um, it's like they're not even thinking about the word tongue anymore because they spoke in other languages. They're so concerned about fire. What does this fire mean? What is it referring to? Uh, James Montgomery Voice says this, when the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, enters a person to enable him or her to give out some of what God has first given, that individual first talks about Jesus Christ. And then he says, fire in the Old Testament always represents God. Fire brings light, so the church brings light to the world. Fire brings warmth, so just like that, it brings warmth to the fellowship. So he's a... He's passed away now. He's very, 
that was a very, very tremendous man of God in, in, in the United States, but you'll notice that he's going off. How do we know that's what the text is actually indicating, that fire is about light, fire brings warmth, the fire in the Old Testament represents God? Lenski, and I always love listening to him, he says, fire is a symbol of purity and purification. Each disciple is to make his confession, prayer, praise, testimony, a pure offering coming from a holy altar that is burning with sacred fire. Like the noise, the tongues were a supernatural, heavenly manifestation. Like, you got to wonder, where are they getting this from? The Tyndale New Testament commentator says this, the author immediately concludes that fire is referring to Luke chapter 3, verse 16. In Luke 3, 16, Jesus answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one who is coming is mightier than I. I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Well, he is absolutely wrong in quoting Luke 3.16. You know why? Because verse 17, if he just read the next verse, says this, And his winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This fire that Jesus is referring to is the fire of eternal judgment. So the tongue of fire resting on the disciples uh, above their head is not the sign of God's eternal judgment. So the Tyndale New Testament commentator is wrong in using that verse. And by the way, I would say that he was influenced by the charismatic theology because they always talk about what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit of fire. There's two baptisms in their theology. The first baptism of the Spirit of God is when you're saved, when you're converted. The second baptism is when the Spirit of God comes upon you like this and energizes you with these great spiritual gifts. If you believe that that is true, then you'll read this, you'll read it into the verse here and say, oh, these tongues of fire, that is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 3, it's a baptism of fire. So there's baptism of the Spirit of God in his conversion, and then there's baptism of fire in terms of his power. But if you take the time and just read the text carefully, you know it's wrong. The fire there is referring to eternal judgment of unbelievers. Now, I don't have time. The time is running out now because I have so much more to go into as we look at this. Um, we want to take a moment and go through uh, this idea that there's a second baptism. But it's going to take another 15, 20 minutes, so I have, to, I have to park it here. But let me just briefly give you the interpretation um, of the, the tongues as a fire uh, distributing themselves on each one of them. What does that all mean? And I will say this, I don't know. Okay? It's a miraculous situation where obviously they received a fire-like tongue on their head because they're going to start speaking in what? In different languages, clearly. But here's what I think is the main point, though. Look at verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Do you guys not see this? That they were all filled? That's not referring to just the, to the 12 apostles. It's all 120 persons, men, women. And if there were some young, uh, young persons there, there was no distinction as to who received the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is what I think is the main point of this text. There's no distinction when the Spirit of God comes. It empowers everyone. And for this particular moment, he gave them the ability to speak in other tongues, and we'll see why as we read this. It's obvious 
He wants to make it clear to all those in that area, this is indeed the work of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for helping us to get through this. There's so much misinterpretation and misunderstanding. Father, give us wisdom as we go through this to understand your precious word. Father, protect us from false teaching and false doctrine. Help us to always understand and double-check all that we hear from others that we might precisely know the meaning of your word and then ultimately know the will of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing a final hymn of worship to the Lord.